Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Jana Valakovic. I'm with the University of California in the Division of Agriculture and Natural Resources in a program called Cooperative Extension. And we've got a dynamic program set up today to talk about wildfire and wildfire preparation. And there's a lot going on in wildfire uh, in California right now. I'm sure many of you are feeling it through smoke or possibly have had to evacuate or um, are thinking about friends and family that are in those positions. So <clears throat> with my colleagues today, we're going to talk about that and talk about how we can uh, do our best to think about adaptation, think about last minute things that you might do prior to evacuation, or think about just sort of general good practices because wildfire is part of our everyday vocabulary now in California, and um, there's a lot that we can do to to improve the situation for ourselves. So I'd like to introduce two of my colleagues and then we've got uh, some, some things that set up for you and really look forward to your questions and comments and, and please put those into the, the chat functions in Facebook and we will try and work through that. So bear with us as we're kind of new with this and um, hope it'll be good for you. So uh, Steve, would you like to introduce yourself? Uh, hi, thanks, Jana. I'm Steve Quarles. I'm a retired UC Corporate Extension Advisor, Emeritus status, so I still do a fair amount of work with my UC colleagues, um, Jana and Susie, as examples. I also uh, spent um, seven or so years with the Insurance Institute for Business and Home Safety at their research center in South Carolina and did wildfire built environment research there. So but happy to be here today and looking forward to um, interacting with you. So thanks for joining. Well, that's kind of a humble introduction. Steve is really the guy that has helped California think very differently about the vulnerabilities that our built environment has to the different types of fire exposures and really giving us the very concrete guidance about how to mitigate those things. So Steve has a big hand in helping us think about uh, you know, a structure of the future um, fire evacuation, all the pieces that are important right now. So um, I want to applaud you, Steve, for being so persistent in those fields and just doing the good work and then continuing to, to champion the issues and uh, have a what looks like not very restful retirement, but one that is really helping all of California. So thank you. Yeah. Susie, how about you? Oh, yes, that old mute function, right? <laughs> of course. There we go. I'm Susie Coker. I'm a forestry advisor for UCANR. So I have the same position Yana does uh, in the central Sierra Nevada. I've been working on forest stewardship projects with private landowners for um, prescribed fire education and also on home retrofit messaging and materials with a lot of help from Steve, obviously. And today I am. Uh, not at my normal location because I uh, evacuated yesterday from the Caldor, Caldor fire. I live in South Lake Tahoe. Um, and so part of what we're going to talk about was is going to be um, structure prep. And I'll share some pictures of uh, what I did with my family before I left. Yeah, you made it really personal, didn't it? <laughs> it's been yeah, yeah. Well, uh, if you're just joining us, we're going to have a good conversation today about structure preparation, evacuation, and you know the, the good practices and tips that you can either be sharing with your friends and neighbors uh, or with your family and or um, that you may want to kind of keep in your back pocket should um, this be a need for you in the future. What we've got is about, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes of, um, <clears throat> of sort of uh, visual images to sort of lay the, the foundation for our conversation today. And then we really welcome your comments and welcome your questions and look forward to some engaging conversation around these topics. So I'm going to kick it off here with just sort of setting the stage around how um, a building is likely to experience wildfire. And it may be through all three types of these exposures, or it may be just, just one of them. And I think each of them illustrate 
the vulnerabilities, the, the built environment, either our businesses or our homes or schools or hospitals, what have you may experience. And the Caldor fire is a great example of what, what is um, impending on South Lake Tahoe. So I think most of us think about fire coming from somewhere uh, away from the building and burning through the vegetation. It doesn't have to be forest. It can be uh, shrubs or grassland. Uh, burning to the building and then the flames touch the house directly and uh, if there's some uh, receptive materials there that are uh, combustible then then you might have flame basically pushing right on the side of the house touching the, the deck the windows the siding what have you. Uh, there are two other types of uh, exposures to be aware of um, we're hearing a lot more about wind and wind distribution of burning vegetation burning bits of material and that comes through something we, we titled embers. Uh, and you can see that in the middle panel here where uh, there's a lot of you know, things moving through the air column um, and bypassing some of our defensible space actions that we may have taken in our landscape um, and creating um, material that can ignite uh, stuff that's clogged in the gutters or the vegetation right next to the house or, or something to that effect. Um, and so that's, you know, it's a threat that comes from a far distance. And we've heard a lot about that this summer, about the wind distribution, creating new spot fires and, and creating expansion of these big, these big fires that we're dealing with. The, the third piece is something called radiant heat. And radiant heat is when your outbuilding uh, is illustrated with a shed here or your garage that might be detached or maybe your neighbor's building or, or a whole bunch of vegetation near to your house is uh, ignited and that creates um, enough uh, heat that there's a convective transfer of heat, which may be high enough to create um, a fragility in the window and you have uh, glass pane breakage and you could have uh, basically an opening into the building. So what we want to do when we think about fire exposures is prepare for all three of these types of scenarios um, and recognize that there are a variety of different issues in each situation um, that take a, a careful hand in, in anticipating. And I think we'll hear some about that from Susie in a little bit um, because she's been thinking about how to apply this concept at her, her property in South Lake Tahoe. And just to kind of make it real, right, here's an image from paradise and you can get the sense of these swirling embers that are able to find the little nooks and crannies and the little vulnerabilities. Um, so this is the type of environment your a home may experience in the future. So how do we prepare for that? Um, and because embers are able to, to find all those little vulnerabilities, it leads to situations where sometimes the vegetation is not involved at all. Um, this image uh, from the Angora fire in South Lake Tahoe a number of years ago, to me sort of looks like an alien came down and, and, and zapped the building there. But what may have happened in fact is that the embers were able to uh, lodge in the home or on the home in a way that um, there was the environment set up so that the embers could ignite the home maybe from the inside out. So it might've penetrated an open window or gone through the vents uh, that might be um, vulnerable to embers. So we'll talk about that in a second. So it's all, you know, preparing for wildfire is appropriate defensible space, but it's also thinking about all these other um, ways that you can create vulnerability. This image um, from, from Southern California shows that, you know, it takes, um, <clears throat> it takes a, a, a coupled approach to really address these issues. And this house clearly appears to have had great defensible space, but uh, something else happened. So let's figure out how to prevent this kind of situation. Uh, so we talk about home hardening, maybe not the best uh, term overall, but the idea is how to make the exterior of the building more resilient, uh, more resistive to, to uh, fire exposures. And you can see where on the upper left, uh, there are roof to wall connections where often you may see leaf litter or needles accumulate. Well, if that ignited, what would happen? Um, is that wall uh, robust enough to be able to resist uh, that type of flame? Or, you know, have you been able to get the material out of the rain gutters? Um, rain gutters are important, but they also can be catchment for embers as well as other, other debris. And so if you have ignition in those gutters, what does that do to your under roof area? Or how does the house uh, interact with the fence? So if the, if the wooden fence um, is ignited, does it wick and bring the flame to the, to the house as shown here? Uh, in Coffee Park in Santa Rosa. 
And then the bottom images are from inside a building, uh, inside the attic. And you can see the, uh, that the attic uh, has a vent on it and the embers are able to pass through that vent. And that's what the little sparks are that you see coming um, into the, the black image. Uh, the one on the right is the under eave area. So all these places are vulnerabilities in our buildings and there are things we can do to protect um, our, our buildings to these issues. Um, we're not going to spend a lot of time talking about all those particular areas. I just want to really, you know, highlight that we have a, a, a lot of resources to talk about each of those component parts and where there might be um, opportunities for a little modification to a building, or if you're starting from scratch and building something new, how to be thoughtful in, in this space from, from the exterior vulnerabilities that buildings experience from wildfire. There's a lot to this. Um, and we try and keep it in, in reasonable messages. So the highest priorities are really the condition of the roof and its edge, uh, the vents, uh, because they have two-way exchange, and then the vegetation and the defensible space right near the home. Um, now, we talk a lot about slopes and whether a house is uh, overhanging a slope, in which case there's more vulnerability to fire running uphill and exposing that deck. Uh, and we also talk about uh, denser neighborhoods or uh, buildings that are closer to each other, like closer than 30 feet, and how do the potential radiant heat issues between each building affect each other? Because really, we're all in this together, and the condition of the neighbor's home may be more important um, than you realize. So how do we help protect each other, and how do we work together? Um, just a little quick image just to look at some of the new vents that are out there um, and available uh, for us as consumers that are designed basically to resist embers as well as flames. Um, and Steve and I and Susie will talk about those in a, in a bit. Um, but there's some upgrades that you can do to existing buildings to improve the, the vent systems. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Steve Corals uh, to give us some sense about how we got to understand all of those issues. Thanks, Susie. Susie, sorry, Yana. Thanks. Um, if you can click start and maybe bring the sound down. Okay. Um, this is, uh, I'm going to show you a, a, a video or two of a couple of demonstrations that we did at um, the IBHS Research Center located in um, South Carolina, um, about an hour south of North Carolina, uh, Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, so here we can, we're, uh, Embers are subjecting, are exposing this house, and we're going to see how embers can ignite combustible things near the home. Um, uh, sorry, I don't know what the, about the pause here, uh, but you can see that debris in the gutter has started to ignite, debris in the bark mulch, the bark mulch has started to ignite. You can see embers lodging against the, uh, the window screen there. Now, this is a vinyl gutter that just detached and fall, fell to the ground. Uh, that's commonly what happens with, with plastic or vinyl gutters with, when debris in them ignites. Um, you can see that the embers have ignited uh, debris on the roof, another uh, gutter uh, detaching and falling. When that debris falls to the ground, it becomes a what's on the ground problem and less of an edge of the roof problem. But the gutter that you can see on the right here, it's a metal gutter, it'll stay put and it, uh, it is always um, an edge of the roof issue. Um, the interior corner there, uh, that's a pretty vulnerable spot because of how fire can grow in that corner. Um, so these are examples where embers ignite its uh, finer fuels, ultimately resulting in direct flame contact to the building or uh, can result in, in uh, radiant heat to the building. But the, the embers did all this by igniting. And so, and so you know, the, the, the message here is to uh, keep debris out of your gutter, use gutter cover devices that minimize accumulation of debris in the gutter, um, remove uh, finer fuels away from your home because of embers will easily ignite them. That includes like combustible bark mulch, for example. Um, so that, that was um, the first demonstration. Here's another one. We'll see similar things. Um, in this one, uh, you see again, uh, bark mulch being ignited pretty easily. Uh, the, the video guy really likes slow motion. And so you got some there. Um, you can see the fire burning underneath the deck. And this became a pretty big deck fire because of uh, flames impinging from the underside. Now that's pretty common um, that 
the deck fires become big, you can turn it off now, Yana. Um, deck fires become big uh, when they start from the bottom. So, you know, keeping uh, debris uh, from underneath the deck, having using, uh, creating, having your deck have a non combustible uh, underneath part is uh, really important uh, to a uh, feature for a, a fire safe home. Um, similar to a non combustible zone around your home, you want to make sure that your deck is treated in the same way. So non combustible zone around your house and under the footprint of any attached deck. We're just sort of looking at um, some other research projects at the uh, lab. Um, this one we're uh, burning things and, and uh, measuring um, embers that are evolved from the burning, in this case, tree. Um, and burning a tree horizontally may seem kind of silly, but it was a good way to uh, um, have the tree burn um, from the bottom to the top. Um, and it mimicked uh, what happens in, in uh, closely packed uh, uh, stands uh, because of the way that the fire can burn up and you have a lot of ladder fuel that is harder to do when you have one tree in isolation, but when you turn that tree horizontal, you, 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 it worked, it worked um, uh, nicely. Um, so the, the videos are just showing you some of the things that we've done, but, but I want really just to, for you to remember the importance of the ember and how ignition of these uh, finer fuels near the home can result in flames or radiant heat to the home. And, um, and you know, I think that's the main reason why embers are so important. So um, I think it's okay to just stop. And um, let's move to uh, Susie, I think. Unless, Yanni, you want to talk a little bit more about the physical space. No, I think that that was really great. And um, sorry, every time I, I touch something, it, 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 I was the one stopping the video if I, if I did that. So my apologies. Um, with, I think we're getting some good questions in. So if you've got questions for Steve or I, we'll, we'll be holding those just for a minute and go through um, some of what Susie has been going through in trying to figure out how to apply um, this co these concepts as you know she knew that wildfire was likely to uh, come her direction. So Susie, I will turn it over to you. I just wanna say that's, that looks like a lot of fun, Steve. <laughs> probably brings out all of our inner um, pyromaniac to watch somebody have a good time burning things up. That looks super fun. And it's also really helped us with our understanding of how houses burn. I really think that our defensible space messages have been getting out to people. Our agencies have been doing a good job of telling people how to do defensible space and how to um, regulate and inspect. In my neighborhood, we had a, a defense blanket inspections last year from CAL FIRE, which was really great. And they give you good suggestions on how to uh, make your house more uh, or less vulnerable. But I don't think that necessarily a lot of these home hardening messages have made it out to everyone, especially things like vents and the five foot non-combustible zone. So I hope that if anything from these wildfires that people will um, have questions and learn um, more about this topic so that they can help protect their own properties. Um, and so here's my house. Uh, I told you earlier, I live in Myers in South Lake Tahoe. I moved there 15 years ago. I bought this house in 2009. It was built in 1961. It um, was lavender. Uh, and had no insulation. There's a lot of old funky cabins next to some pretty nice new modern homes. Um, and so that's the kind of neighborhood I'm in, fairly mixed with funky old houses that need a lot of upgrading and pretty modern specimens. Um, I went around my house. I, uh, you know, I've been watching the Caldor fire for the last two weeks. I had evacuees at my house from Polly Pines. Um, so all along, I've been pretty sure that it's coming my way. So two weeks is actually a lot of time to prepare. There's some other things we've been doing for some years, um, but I, it has been a lot of work in the last two weeks trying to just finish off those projects that you had in mind to fireproof your house. Here's the east side of the house. Um, there's a chimney there. My husband's gonna put stone slate. You can see the slate at the bottom, but we haven't gotten around to that part yet. 
Um, what I think this is the most defensible side of my house. It has that um, six inches of concrete at the bottom, which is the, uh, you know, the, what's the word I'm looking for? Vertical. Foundation, there we go. Um, so that looks pretty good. Uh, we have been putting a lot of um, gravel everywhere. That's actually because we're gardeners. And so the gravel we're sifting out in our, from our garden bed. So none of it's imported. It's all like, that's how much dirt we've been sifting through uh, for growing our vegetables. And um, so I think what I see here is this is my side of the house. I think that looks the best. You'll notice on the left, there's a wooden deck. Uh, it's pretty low. It's hard to see that any um, material gets in there. I do know that like squirrels and rabbits and bunnies and stuff go in there. So there may be material under there, but there's no way I could ever clean it out. Uh, on our list is to remove this deck. It's quite old. And uh, the pavers are sitting in a pile over here. To do that, it's just not a project we've gotten to yet. So next slide. Yeah, give me just a second here. Sure. Okay, there's the south side of the house, the one that um, reaches the, uh, looks at the main street. Um, my husband built this woodshed recently. There were a lot of aspen growing up. They are really quite invasive. So we um, removed all the vegetation there. Um, this is what the deck looks like coming up to the to the siding. I don't have that six inches of vertical clearance, so I'm somewhat worried about this. You can see that I have um, lots of uh, lots of hoses out there. Um, we did do some soaking of the wood before we left, but you don't want to leave your hoses on as you go because you could really affect water pressure. But we did, before we evacuate, tried to wet everything down. And then over here on the right is the vent. So um, we did install Vulcan vents, which are um, supposed to help avoid embers being able to go into our house. Um, what my husband does is he covers the vents every winter because I think I said we don't have a lot of insulation. So if we leave the vents open in the winter, it's cold in our house. And normally we open them all summer long so that the, the breezes can flow through and the heat doesn't build up. Um, but he took out those winter covers and uh, put them up so that uh, no embers could penetrate. And since I sent you these pictures too, I worked with my neighbor. We have really great neighbors um, that you can see if you go to the next slide. Uh, their house is really close to ours. So um, that's the back of the house and you see that two trees and the big house next to us. That is less than 30 feet away for sure with a wooden fence in between. Um, and there's the part of the siding that we haven't fixed yet. That's the color it was before we bought it, lavender, and it looks a lot nicer now. Um, anyway, right before the evacuation order, we uh, put a huge ladder up there and uh, my husband was able to cover up the main vent on the front of the house with a big wooden cover. But we did also discover underneath all those windows, there's a lot of those little bird stop vents. We're hopeful that covering up the front vent means that the air won't go all the way through and out. Uh, maybe you can give me a, your opinion on whether that's useful at some point, Steve, but um, we at least got some of those vents covered um, because I think that's their big vulnerability. And I think that if that house starts to burn from embers, then my house is definitely burning down because that radiant heat would hit that side of the house. Um, uh, here's the north side of the house. There's another wooden deck. This one's in much better shape. It was there when we moved in. Um, basically moved everything away from the side. It's a little harder to pull this one down because it's in pretty good shape, unlike the front one, but it's on my list of things to do in the next five years. Um, we've got the hot tub with a little bucket there. We've got the hoses all staged if we have structure protection. Next slide. Okay, so this is the west side of the house, the one that's the most um, vulnerable. So um, as we've been changing the siding around, um, we have really thought hard about what to do on this side of the house. We have put in the tempered windows that are suggested through the Wildland Urban Interface Building Codes or Chapter 7A right there. 
Um, so there we go. We have um, a stronger window. Um, we have been looking for hardy plank. What we found out was we only need 17 boards and you can't buy less than 200, at least at our local hardware stores. That's uh, why we have not uh, currently covered that west side, which I'm sure makes it more vulnerable since it's just plastic and, and OSB underneath. But um, that's on the list of things to do. We finally did um, get rid of a lot of the material that was stored there and it's down to gravel. So I think that's pretty good. In the yard, we moved um, a lot of combustible things out into the irrigated area. So you can see there's one trash can full of, um, full of wood. Um, we have water staged everywhere. And then, um, Jan, if you wouldn't mind going back one, I have a question for Steve, and that's about these good neighbor fences. And you can tell me when I'm done here, but there was a lot of stuff stuck in there. And I think I've heard you talk about these before, but um, I would love to hear your thoughts altogether on these good neighbor fences, which as you've explained is there's a board on each side. So there's all this area underneath that stuff can collect. So what um, my husband actually did was take out the leaf blower. Um, I did a lot of that by hand, but the leaf blower did a much better job. The concern being that a little fire starts there at the bottom and then um, starts the fence on fire, which is in between us. So. So you're right. I mean, the, uh, the good neighbor fence is hard to ignite uh, strictly with embers, but no matter what kind of fence you have, um, if, if it's a combustible fence, wood or vinyl, it's, it doesn't matter. It is the debris at, that collects at the, at the base of the fence that will make the um, fence much more vulnerable because that debris is pretty easy to ignite by ember exposure and you'll have flames uh, touching the, this end, and in this case, um, a fairly easy uh, thing to ignite at that point. But, and so, you know, the message, a good neighbor fence is good from an ember ignition perspective, if you're only talking about or considering the material of the fence itself, any fence is gonna be much more vulnerable with debris at the bottom. And so um, routinely uh, removing debris uh, from the base of fencing is, is, is a great idea because of how much more vulnerable the fence is when it's there. Great, thank you. And then um, I think I only have two slides left, Yana. You... Okay, we'll do those two slides and then we get, we're getting some great questions. So we'll use okay. your slides to help answer, I think some of those great questions. So if you've got questions and I, and I really wanna acknowledge you some really interesting things coming in, we will happily answer those. So. Uh, you covered here. I think I'll move yeah. on to the next one. Um, yeah, a lot of work. Actually, it looks much better than uh, because we were working on that yesterday. It looks better than this now. Um, lots of old project wood um, on his way to the dump. Lots of stacks of wood. Um, my husband's a handy fellow. Totally covered um, and tried to be locked down against any ember intrusion. Um, and then any kind of valuables, boats, cars, you want to move them away from your house because the house would catch the boat or the car on fire. Or vice so, versa. Yeah. So we have moved those uh, things out into a vacant lot. Um, and we scratched, since then, we scratched line around it um, and it looks much better. And we trimmed up the trees on the left and we scratched and cut fire line all around that area. I think that's it. Yeah, well, and it's amazing to think, I mean, you did have a few days to be anticipating this and, um, and I, I can imagine that you're, you all are both tired and sore and <laughs> it takes a lot of work and we all accumulate things over time and great projects and great things. Um, and then they suddenly look a little less, less great when you're <laughs> thinking about how they might, might interplay with fire. So um, I, think, I think I'm gonna start from the top here. So Steve Mayo asked the question, how effective are roof sprinklers in stopping embers and radiant heat? And maybe what I'll do is I'll go back to the one that's on the deck just to sort of illustrate the point. And um, Steve, do you wanna start talking about sprinklers and, and what your thoughts are about sprinklers? Yeah, so uh, Steve, thanks for that question. Um, I think that the number one thing to uh, remember when you're considering exterior sprinklers is that it is a strategy that you would use in conjunction with and not instead of any other thing you might be doing. Um, 
So these uh, uh, roof sprinklers and things like applying a gel, these are things that I call an active strategy because you they're intended to be short term and in, in, in effectiveness or short term in terms of how long you're going to do it. So you do it when the wildfire is immediately threatening. Um, the alternative is a, is a passive strategy. So creating a, a non combustible zone next to your home, you know, you do it and in besides routine maintenance, you know, you, you, you're done. Uh, replacing your wood shake roof with a class A roof covering, you do it and you're done. So those are passive strategies because once you do them, you can sort of uh, forget about them except for the, the uh, you know, the routine maintenance part. So that's the number one thing. Um, sprinkler systems can work. You know, I think most people would recommend myself included that you have a, a standalone water supply is much better and then anticipate that the power will go off. And so you, you have to be able to, you know, have the thing work with no power. So you have a backup power supply. Um, it's better if, if they have a, a feature that allows intermittent uh, working. So it'll, you know, you'll spray, it'll stop, it'll spray, it'll stop, you know, and because you don't need to spray all the time. Um, but I think uh, really there's a lot unknown about how effective they can be, you know, whether the droplets are going to go where you want them to go during high wind events. So you can turn the sprinkler on once it's installed and see where it goes and where it doesn't go. Um, but you're not quite sure whether this sp spread area is going to be the same under a wind event because the wind's going to blow uh, that water around. So, um, so I would think it's, 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 it's a strategy. It seems it can work. Um, I would really cautious you to caution you to uh, not think that you can do this and do nothing else. Um, I think when you, if you go down this route, once the sprinkler is uh, installed, turn it on and see where it doesn't go. I mean, there are places uh, where embers can accumulate, and if the water doesn't get there, then then and you have combustible things in the vicinity, then then you're you're not any better off. Um, and we'll just one more thing. Um, you talked about roof sprinklers. So, I mean, that's one place you could put them. Another place would be in the under eave area. And, and then you can put them on the property and point to the house. So these, it's three basic locations. Um, and I, you know, I, I uh, would just urge you to be cautious in going down this road and, and take these other, institute these other, um, passive strategies first, because I think they are, they, we know they work. And, and so I would do those first. Right, and then we talk about sort of icing on the cake and I think the sprinkler sort of fits into that, that category. Once you've taken care of everything else, uh, then maybe this is where you go. But do consider the hose line that brings and feeds the water is also vulnerable to fire. So if, you're, if it's going through a combustible bunch of pine needles or grass or something like that, you might lose your water line that deploys it. Uh, so there's there's more to it. Um, <clears throat> there's a next question here uh, from Christi uh, Christina Callahan. How do you build decks for best protection? Um, and Dora, who's part of our team who's supporting this event, Dora, this would be a great time to post uh, the Firewise fact sheets that I sent you in the list. Um, it's in that list of resources yesterday or today um, because there's a really nice fact sheet about how to build decks. Um, Steve, I'll let you go over you know, come a couple of the points, but um, just to know that there's some new um, concepts out there about how we can do some, some improvements in, in how we install these decks. So, uh, Christina, thanks for the question. Um, I think it's important to uh, just consider the ways that decks can be vulnerable. So they can be vulnerable because of flames coming at the deck from the ground, so a, a surface fire. This could happen, you know, under a number of scenarios, but um, you know, that's that's one pathway for a fire for a deck to be vulnerable. The other one is an ember exposure um, from above, so embers landing on the deck. And then the third thing is just stuff you have on your deck that can also make your deck vulnerable. So the stuff on your deck, furniture, and more importantly, cushions, brooms that you might have leaning some vegetation you might have on your deck. 
things that, that can ignite via embers in addition to the deck itself. So these are the things that can make your deck vulnerable. So best practices uh, for deck are things you can do to help protect your deck, you know, creating uh, as, as, as non-combustible zone underneath the deck. And if your deck is on a slope or overhangs a slope, then you need to consider, um, you know, the vegetation downslope of the deck and treat it so that you minimize the opportunity to flames impinge on the underside of the deck. Um, the underside of the deck flame impingement is one way to have a, a pretty large fire. Um, ember ignited decks are initially small at least, um, and, but you can have flames that are reach the building just the same, but it would be a pretty small fire, but a big fire typically is, is an un, under the deck fire. For uh, ember protection, you know, remove debris from between the deck board gaps. Um, some research that, that uh, I was involved with when I was with IBHS pretty clearly demonstrated that the higher density deck boards, a plastic composite deck board, the higher density hardwood uh, deck, decking like IPE, uh, these are pretty resistant to ember ignition. The ignition will, will occur in the deck board gap above a joist. That's the, that's the ignition point for the deck itself. So uh, keep that uh, debris, keep that area clean of debris or just make it uh, harder to ignite. Um, and then, you know, stuff on your deck um, when you're evacuating, patio cushion should be uh, brought inside, move uh, furniture away from the house, um, particular well, combustible furniture in particular, uh, you know, the wood furniture. Um, wicker is particularly vulnerable to ember ignition. So, and if you can bring that inside, bring it inside. If it's too big to bring inside, then move it away. That's similar for, um, um, similar for uh, uh, the, the planters you might have. There are a couple of mitigation strategies that can work. If we're looking at Susie's deck here, it's harder to do with Susie's deck in this particular situation because you can see that the deck boards are perpendicular to the house. If your deck boards are parallel to the house, then you can remove the deck board closest to the house and replace it with a non-combustible option, whether that be an, a metal deck board or a metal grate. And you can do it in, in, in Susie's deck configuration. It's just more difficult because you'll, you'll not only, you have to sort of cut off the ends of each one of those boards, but you'll have to probably reframe to support that non-combustible deck board that would run parallel to the house. But perpendicular to the house, uh, no, no particular issue. And that is just like having your deck making a non-combustible zone for your deck right next to the right next to your house in this case. And so the fire uh, that could be burning in that deck board gap towards the towards Susie's home. Let's hope that this isn't actually true, but um, uh, then will be stopped by that non-combustible component right next to the house. The, another thing using Susie's example again, as I'm really glad, glad you had this picture, Susie. <laughs> um, you could um, um, incorporate or in, install a piece of metal flashing um, vertically that would just be one deck board width and, and, and beneath at that lap joint between the bottom joint, dot, dot, um, bottom uh, piece of siding and the one above it. So you wanna make sure that water can't get between the piece of metal flashing and the wood siding, because that would be a rot problem for you. But if you tuck it in at that, at that first lap joint, then you'd have embers potentially uh, accumulating near the home, but it'd be uh, against your metal deck board if you've done this, this strategy and this metal piece of flashing. And so there's nothing there to, to ignite. So these are um, things you can do um, that would improve the, uh, that would you know, uh, reduce the vulnerability of, of your deck. But just remember the things that can make your deck vulnerable, fire from underneath, embers from above, and um, stuff on your deck. And if you can sort of address each one of those, 
uh, your deck has a, a much better chance of of surviving. You you your deck might be damaged under under the ember scenario, but your house would would um, would uh, be. Um, uh, and I think I think this is an important an important point to spend some time on because we get so many questions about decks, and this is one of the most popular issues that people face. So I, I want to jump just a little bit ahead on our question list for the three of us that we can see. Um, so someone had a creative suggestion, Brian Marshall. Would you ever consider um, putting sheetrock on top of the deck as a part of your last minute evacuation strategy, assuming you had sheetrock? Um, so I you know I don't know if we want to just riff off kind of these last minute things. So Susie showed us about how she did a bunch of the cleaning work. She's got a temporary sprinkler that she's trying to apply. She's cleaned up around the deck. Um, <clears throat> you know, one of the things, Steve, you've heard me talk about lately, like what about if you don't have the ability to, to do the flashing because it's last minute right now, what about installing a soaker hose on a timer right at this transition point because wind won't affect where that water goes. Um, so here in that in that vein, like if you had some extra sheetrock around, could you use it? I think I would be thinking about maybe the the, the stair um, setup. Like, what does it take to get up on top of the deck? Um, have you done a you know the non combustible work, making sure you've done all the clearance around those stairs? Maybe the sheetrock would be appropriate on the ground around those steps. Um, any thoughts between the two of you about about how to create that barrier, assuming that you've done the under under deck work and the rest of the deck is not exposed to to fire from from um, outside coming underneath it. Yeah, so I think Brian, that's a great um, suggestion. I think anything that protects those deck deck board gaps from accumulating debris. And one thing that became clear during our experiments uh, was that the the that gap is is a receptor of embers and. If there's a joist underneath it, they'll they'll sit on top of the joist. But if there's not a joist there, they'll just fall down and hit whatever's on the ground below. So that's another reason for this non-combustible zone under the under the deck, because those embers will get there from from in front of the deck or from on top of the deck. Um, I, I, I you know I, I think spreading out the the, the gypsum wallboard that you, you're considering. And if you have enough to cover, you know, I, I think uh, that's one strategy um, to to do that. You want to make sure that um, that that strategy you have enough to to get all the way to the to your home, uh, because embers are going to accumulate at the deck to wall intersection, and they're they're going to accumulate depending on the wind, depending on, you know, the wind laid and ember thing, but feel they will uh, uh, recirculate back some several feet from your exterior wall and, and stagnate there. And so, you know, you could, um, um, if you don't have enough to go all the way around, I think if, if you were to have enough gypsum wallboard to lay it, you know, uh, um, the four foot against the house and the eight foot coming out, you know, typically, I think you would hit the spots where that, that stagnation point would occur. And I think you would protect the deck pretty well doing that. I think that's yeah. a, a good idea. I do like what you said earlier, though, Steve, about the difference between active and passive um, protection. Um, in our, the long term, our goal is to rip off that deck and put in a stone patio. And then we wouldn't need to be worrying about this every wildfire season. That would be a protection that's there permanently. And I wouldn't have to soak it or cover it or all that other stuff. So uh, we probably are going to move that up on our list of projects if we have a house to work on when we get back. Yeah. Well, I'm hoping you do too. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so if you're just joining us, uh, feel free to give us some questions. We've got four or five more questions kind of set up here. And I think these are all really great things that are coming in. Christina Callahan um, asked a couple different ones and I, and I wanna answer one of them really quickly here. She says, what do you mean by staging hoses? And so Susie, maybe you could talk to us a little bit about you know, your, your use of buckets and hoses and, sure. and kind of whether you're thinking you're getting things ready for the idea that there could be some defenders of your home and you might have- Yeah, I'm hoping so. <laughs> and I'm Susie, hoping so. Susie, one more thing that Marsha wants to know whether you did anything to treat your wood siding, so. I was going to go back there. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Okay. Well, as far that. as okay. hoses go, um, 
we have a lot of hoses. Like I said, we're pretty big gardeners. I didn't include a picture of the garden, but I picked all my zucchini yesterday because I knew no one would be there to water or maintain them. But um, we have a lot of hoses. We have a lot of buckets. Um, we put them all out in all set up, uh, not closed down so that uh, any kind of uh, structure protection force, any kind of hand crew that came by would be able to access our hoses. There's also um, ladders strategically around the house in case there was something on top of the roof that needed to be done. Um, but yeah, there you can see there's one hose bib in the front of the house and we have one hose bib in the back of the house. So that hose bib has like four connectors. No, I think the other one has actually four hoses coming out of it. This one has two and they're stretched to vulnerable areas. So if we do get lucky and there's a, um, an engine in front of our house, which seems unlikely, um, there would be easy access for those people to um, put out a spot fire with the water we already have. So that's what we're doing there. And then you use some buckets on the chance that maybe the water supply gets cut off at some point. Mm -hmm. And so if there's just a little spot fire, if there happens to be someone walking by, they could see those buckets and maybe throw water on that little spot fire. Yeah. Although, you know, we did just get a notice that our power was turned off, which wouldn't help with soaker hoses on a timer at this point. So there's a, a problem with that. Issue. But that's that's the, the rationale for a backup power supply should you go down this exterior right. sprinkler route. I mean, it's sort of a critical yeah. part does, of, of it. Does the power control how much water you have available? Because the timer would be a, a battery operated timer. No, that's a good point. No, we're on municipal. So we got water no matter what. We just don't have power at this point. And do they have to pump water to, to run the municipal water? Like, so if they lose water, is it gravity? system. So these are all the complexities when you start to think about it, right? right. So they're in a municipal environment. It's not a well, that's the good news, yes. Right. Um, there are a lot of folks that provide their own water, and what does that look like? I spoke to a woman yesterday um, who's in a rural setting, and she was telling me about active uh, fire suppression, working with fire crews, using her water support, water sources, and for her property, she's in, in the Monument Fire, which is up in Northern California near me, and they used 30,000 gallons of water in one day uh, for suppression activities, um, save their home. But just a good illustration of what kind and quantity of water you might be dealing with in a, in a more rural setting. So water is the key issue. And so a lot of what Steve and Susie and I talk about are things that you could do in thinking about the, the potential that you might be um, having a building having to defend itself on its own with no, no additional fire personnel. And so all that good planning and action, you know, comes into play and, and um, we have pretty good evidence that, that it can make a difference. So um, this is not sort of trivial conversation and wishful lists. It's really pretty evidence driven. We saw some of those videos that Steve was able to illustrate. Um, so we, we know that this stuff can work. Let's talk a little bit more about Christiana's question, and I think it relates to this here. So I mentioned that there were three types of exposures, direct flame contact, embers, as well as radiant heat. And she said, do those rocks near your structure radiate heat and create additional issues? Is that something that, that we should be thinking about? Do either of you have a comment? It never occurred to me. That's a good point. <laughs> I, I, I could talk about this for a while, but I think the, the quickest answer is no. Yeah. Okay. You don't need to worry I'm about to hear that. That. <laughs> that all came with the house. That all came with the house. Yeah. So yeah. never right. occurred to me to remove it since it's a rock. But yeah, there's a lot of thermal mass in that rock. It will heat up, but the amount of energy that it can release that would, you know, potentially influence your uh, siding and I don't think there's a problem. We, we know that the Native Americans, you know, used heated up rocks to cook stuff in baskets back in the day. Um, so rocks can get hot. I'm not arguing that point, but I, I, I don't think that you have to worry about a heated up rock. In order for that rock to get heated up, your sidings can get heated up also by that same source that heated up the rock. And I think that's the thing to worry about. So let's go to Brian Marshall's question here, which is, would you consider temporary uh, covers of your events? Um, so Susie showed this really beautiful vent cover and- Pretty, huh? <laughs> yeah, and I'm, I'm amazed that it's painted. Um, <laughs> your husband's awesome. 
uh, you know, what can you do in those last minute cases where maybe you don't have that? Um, you, we've talked about metal tape is something that you can use, uh, a piece of plywood perfectly effective, um, you know, very heavy tin foil uh, and a staple gun can, can cover those vents. This is not something you want to do in the long term because you want, you know, airflow to occur, but in that short term uh, notion, you know, there's some things you can do if you have enough time. So what about the under events? Um, I would just say that I think it's really important. And as I said earlier, we um, talked to our neighbor and we got, we got it up there an hour before the evacuation order. And with all my neighbors, I feel like uh, defensible space has a concept uh, people understand. I texted my neighbor in Christmas Valley uh, once the evacuation warning came out and she said, oh, should I rake around my house? I said, uh, yeah, and you should cover your vents um, because I think that's something if you have a couple of days, it's, it's a really important thing to do. Yeah. Uh, Jeff Mon asked about, red, about wood decking and I think we've covered that um, in some pretty good detail. Again, uh, there are some practices if you are in the position of either replacing a deck uh, or thinking about building a deck, um, there's some, some new details on installation that are great on those fact sheets. Um, I just add that um, the temporary cover, I know it's not pretty, uh, that my neighbors did was just a piece of wood, a little piece of plywood and nails. They had a very large opening and they just went up there with plywood and nails, like uh, you might if your hurricane is coming over your, over your windows, right? Because maybe in the long run, a little disfiguration from some nails isn't your biggest issue anymore. And I would just uh, chime in that the, the vent that you're seeing on the right hand picture here, it's, it's a gable end vent. And similarly, the vents that would be in the under in the blocking in in the under eave area, those vents that present a face that's perpendicular to the wind flow are the most vulnerable to ember entry. And so in particular, covering up those vents. Um, if, if, and, and, well, particularly again, if you have a mesh kind of a screen, um, it is beneficial. So, and this is also important if you store stuff in your attic space. Um, if you store stuff, you know, it's typically going to be combustible items, and, and the boxes that would be in your attic would be uh, items that would. Uh, result in embers accumulating at the base of that item. And once you have something that the embers can accumulate against in quantity, it just increases the chance that that ignitions will occur. And attic fires are sometimes missed, so to speak, while, when they're uh, small by passing fire trucks during a wildfire event. And because right, they can and, smolder for a while before- They can smolder for a while. Yeah. And then by the time the flames are present, and you know, it, it's, it's really, an attic fire is, is, is a harder thing to, to put out. So it can't be too late. So if you're you know, just joining us, I got, we've got a couple more questions. I think we've got enough time to answer those. And if you want to send us one or two more, we're happy to answer them. Christina Callahan asked also if there are better fire safe tarps. And I think Susie was faced with some interesting challenges in that um, there's some material that she just couldn't move. And um, since they like to do home projects, there's a fair bit of uh, wood piles and, and other treasures that are vulnerable. So she made the choice to, to cover some of them with non-combustible, with combustible tarps, um, thinking that it might at least keep some of the stuff from accumulating in those nooks and crannies. But um, what do we know about non-combustible tarps? And I would just add that this one on the left is much thicker, heavier duty that was used in industrial applications than the one in the middle, which is something you would just buy at the hardware store. I feel much better about this one on the left than the one in the middle, which I think is maybe kind of not very helpful, but it's doing something. So sorry, go ahead. Where do we get uh, non-combustible tarps for one? And So there is no such thing as a non-combustible tarp. There we go. There's yeah, fire, no <laughs> there's, but, but there are there are fire rated tarps uh, out there, um, and they have to pass a particular test that involves a, a flame, flames touching a, a small strip of the sample material, and then it's a sort of a flame uh, propagation evaluation where you get the, the rating for the tarp. Um, 
what we aren't so clear about is, is how these uh, tarps resist embers. I think overall what Susie did is much better than doing nothing because embers will um, find their way into um, the small spaces and you know, likely debris has found their way there before the embers do. And so you have a lot of fine fuel for those embers to ignite and then you have a pretty big fuel source. So you know, I think covering with a tarp is better than not covering with a tarp. Um, regarding the, the fire, re fire retardant treated tarps, you know, I don't know that we have so much information about, about how well they weather and so, you know, how long will they be good at what they're supposed to do. And we don't have information about their resistance to ember ignition. Um, so there's some unknowns about tarps, but in terms of, of um, longevity and such. Um, but I I think, and in, in, in lieu of doing nothing, what Susie and Rick did was a far better um, approach. And that I I'm shocked at how much stuff was just right in there in between the boards. Like I have two pine trees and I haven't, we haven't attended to these piles in five years and it's just right. packed with debris. I mean, right. I, I don't even have that many trees on my property. Yeah, and that, that's why what you did was a far better solution. Uh, yeah, strategy. And I accidentally skipped over Marsha's question about treating the wood siding. And I think this is a great mm -hmm. illustration of you've got accumulated material that's stored for safety <laughs> in, in the rain off it, but it's right against some wood siding. Uh, how do you think about those issues? Right. Um, this is a shed that's metal underneath. That was siding put up to make it look better. Um, it's an old storage container. It's the back end of a truck. Oh. It came with the house and we got at least pulled away from the house. So I didn't it look totally junky. You can see on the left, that is what it looks like. And my husband put a roof over it and tried to make it look like some sort of uh, shed. <laughs> but it's actually the back end of a truck. Um, so yeah, thinking about that, probably we'd be better off without that si uh, attractive siding that seemed like a good idea at the time. Um, but if you go backwards in the slides, I can tell you that, like I said, our house was built in 1961. It's got siding that's one inch thick cedar. And you can see we haven't finished it because there it is lavender. Um, but uh, we pulled it off, turned it around and put it back on. It's hard to come by this kind of beautiful wood anymore. So it's it's not treated with any kind of fire resistant. It's just stained. Um, from my understanding, I didn't know of any products that would improve the durability of siding um, and was focusing more on the six inch vertical space underneath the siding to help us out for fire hazard reduction. There And, and there aren't coatings right yet that, um can provide longer term protection. So um, I think there's a number of uh, manufacturers out there that would like to have such a thing and they're working on such a thing. But today, um, if, if, if you are faced with uh, someone uh, you know, suggesting that you uh, apply a coating to your siding to make it, to, to reduce the vulnerability of your siding, then I would ask to see uh, the test results. I want to. I want to see the data that that makes you think that it's worthwhile, and gives you some comfort level that it'll last however long it says it'll last. Whether that be you know five years or whatever, you want to you know, show me the data because I don't think that you can. Uh, that right now anybody can show you that data. Now Dora is probably putting pieces in the chat, and this kind of relates to this next question here. Jay Murdoch asks, um, while there are wildland fire code, what is the least you can do under the law? What are some of the best practices you would choose if building your own home? Um, and is there a design builder guide for above code best practices? So um, there are lots and lots of resources to kind of illustrate some of the basic concepts here. And Dora, if you want to click in to the to the chat some of these chapter 7a wildland urban construction codes it's a great place for people to kind of come up to speed on on the materials themselves as well as the different code options um, and i think the the work that 
uh, the uh, wildfire home retrofit guide that just recently came out and some some resources that have come out through South Lake Tahoe and and um, and um, uh, Nevada can give us some good ideas about thinking through some of these issues um, and how to make sort of material choices and design considerations here. And I'm sure any of us would be happy to follow up with you to sort of think through the issues uh, in general. And so, Jay, I would just also add that um, there is some work being done um, uh, through a CAL FIRE uh, um, created a small committee to come up with um, things that um, homeowners can do, both code and code plus, to resist, to, to reduce the vulnerability of the built environment to wildfire. And, um, you know, we are taking an approach that would allow the homeowner to, or and our inspector, however, to uh, sort of uh, put the home in context with its surrounding in terms of coming up with, with, with mitigation strategies for the home. So if your neighbor's far away, you know, then these are things you can do. If your neighbor is really close by, then, then these are things that you could do. So th th that kind of um, strategy, and it's uh, part of a much larger program, but it, it, it should be coming around um, not so long from now, but but it's still you know still not ready for for public consumption. But it's in the it's in the works, and it might get at some of the things you're asking about. Well, and as we get close to wrapping up here, I, I just really want to acknowledge um, how how hard it must be for Susie and her family to sort of try to apply this in the last minute and um, and you know look through all the stuff you have and and make the choices about what to do. And I I love the expression you sent in this photo with us about, all right. <laughs> Time to go. Time to go. Um, so it's I guess that I would just add, you know, um, like I said, I was keeping an eye on the fire and I had two weeks of uh, time to prep. Um, and, you know, it's still not really enough. Um, you may have projects in mind that you want to do. And I guess I would just say, you may not have as long as you think you do to get around to it. So try and prioritize those uh, time to prep. Um, and, you know, it's still not. Um, and I guess just as, as we close here, I thought we might just bring forward if, if you're thinking that evacuation is imminent or it's something to be aware of, maybe let's just kind of go over some of those last minute best, best practices. And I think this is six things to do in six hours prior to evacuation. We all, I'm sure, could add things to the list, but this idea that we really need to just close our windows, our pet doors, and our skylights. I mean, we all have places that are open um, in our houses. And so, you know, take a quick a cursory look around those and really close that pet door if you can. Um, you know, it's a great place for embers to, to get in. Um, Steve, maybe you want to talk about number two? Number two. Um... You know, I think going back to the importance of the ember in terms of uh, home ignition scenarios, things like cushions, particularly um, um, the, the uh, fiber doormats are, are vulnerable to ember ignitions. Um, so, you know, get those things off the deck inside. If you have, happen to have a wooden uh, gate or, or a fence with a gate that attaches to your house, um, open the gate. As part of your as your part of your evacuation strategy, so that you will in effect you know create a non combustible zone, nothing nothing to attach to your house. So I mean that would be a good a good uh, a good strategy also. So. Uh, three, Susie, you want to take three? You're on mute. We don't have a lot of propane. We're on natural gas uh, where I live. And so um, what we did was turn off the natural gas tap to the house and also turn off all our pilot lights, but the barbecue propane tanks and the ones in the shed for camping, we did remove and put farther away from anything important so that if they went, they wouldn't uh, catch anything else on fire. All right, and number four, we've already seen Susie illustrate, you know, staging buckets of water and garden hoses in visible locations and a ladder, things so that if someone happens to be able to walk by, they might be able to just take care of that little, that little spot fire if it, if it happens. Um, I love, Susie, your last photo. Um, so dress for the evacuation. 
Um, I know you had some specialized clothing, but do you want to talk a little bit about what dress for day evacuation means? Sure, if you want to show the picture, there I am. I, you know, I found, I realized I don't have a hard hat at home. I have a full fire gear kit and I have my fire kit with me. I've got Nomex on top, but if I didn't, I would have worn some, um, some, um, you know, flannel or a cotton shirt, cotton pants, leather boots. Um, I have a respirator. I mean, I actually just got it this weekend because N95s just didn't seem to be cutting it with the amount of, uh, uh, wildfire smoke while we were out there trying to prep the property. So got them from Amazon and it was really a, a game changer for us to be able to be out on the property doing things uh, while the smoke was there. So um, something like that is helpful. A hat, uh, this is all in case you get um, stranded somewhere while you're evacuating. I have to say that our evacuation went really well. Uh, they got 25,000 people out in about, you know, a few hours. I didn't go right away. Uh, I hear that there were some backups in traffic at the beginning. I went a few hours later and it was very orderly, very straightforward. Um, so I never felt in any danger. But, you know, like I said, we had a lot of warning and other people are not so fortunate. Like in paradise with the campfire, people didn't have a lot of time to get out. So changing your clothes in case you're gonna get stuck in some kind of fire situation, I think is important for your evacuation. So full covering, a hat, um, any kind of gloves that you can do in case, in case you actually are entrapped by fire. And luckily we didn't have that situation. Right, so dress for the moment because you don't know what you're gonna experience. And then last of, of course is, you know, have your go bag packed, uh, have your pets taken care of and, and be ready to go and know where your keys are. I heard a great story the other day of someone trying to evacuate at the last minute and lost their keys. Mm -hmm. And we spent the next hour after prepping their entire vehicle in a total panic and not being able to find their keys. So, um, and for us, I would just say that our biggest issue was the cat. So we kept the cat um, locked in the bathroom while we moved all our stuff out. Um, and so that we could make sure to have him on hand when it was time to go. I went in there with the cat carrier, hung out with him for five or 10 minutes so he wouldn't freak out and tried to stuff him in there. And that worked well. Um, but that's another issue that people have. They feel all freaked out and can't leave their pets at the last minute. So just plan ahead for that. Well, thank you both uh, for, for being willing to share your wisdom and your personal experience, Susie, and all the challenges that you guys have been through. So if you've just been joining us, we've had a, a good conversation with our cooperative extension team talking about wildfire preparation and and things to do in the sort of pre-evacuation stage and elements of prepping your home and uh, key components. So um, all those links are available and we're happy to keep supporting you in your questions and, and recognize that this is a little bit complicated, but with some, some good effort, I think we can really start to make improvements and, and improve our, our safety and, and the survival of our, of our communities. And thank you, Steve, for all your good advice over the years. I feel um, luckier than most that I have some good ideas about what I should be doing. So thank you. Thank you. And thanks to everybody for joining and for your great questions. It's been uh, wonderful. Thank you. Excellent questions.